It's a pleasure to bring you a brand new talk that I've never given before. Um, one that I've been thinking about for a couple of years now. And thankfully in the past few months, there's been several new studies that really helped me put it together. But the title of the talk is, Is the Key to Stopping ALS Being Flushed Down Our Toilets? And the sections of this talk are as follows. I'll give you a little bit of background on what is called the microbiome. And then we'll talk a little bit about the gut microbiome and its role in gastrointestinal diseases. We'll look at some very recent studies that have raised the question of whether or not the gut microbiome might play some role in ALS. And then I'll tell you about the studies that I know of that are ongoing or about to start that I hope is gonna shed some more light on this interesting topic. So let's get into some background. What is a microbiome? Well, sometimes you'll see this called a microbiota. It's the family of organisms living in or on our bodies. Believe it or not, we are all covered in viruses, bacteria, parasites, and fungi. And in fact, we've known about this since 1683 when this was first described. Interestingly, the microbiome differs a lot between different people. Some people say it's, it's almost like a fingerprint. It's so unique. And it also differs a lot between different sites within a person. So there's at least four different microbiomes. There's an oral microbiome. There's a skin microbiome. There's a urogenital microbiome. And then there's the one we're going to be talking about today, which is called the digestive tract microbiome, also known as the gut microbiome. So the gut microbiome is the largest and most complex of all the microbiomes that we have. Believe it or not, there is estimated to be a close to 40 trillion different organisms in our gut microbiomes alone. In fact, the number of organisms in our gut microbiome alone outnumber all the rest of the cells in our bodies. And so some people say that we're actually more non-human cells than we are human cells. That's absolutely right. One of the things that's very confusing when you read papers about the microbiome is that people talk about what's in there in lots of different ways. So some people talk about the phyla that are in there. Some people talk about the genera that are in there. Some people talk about the species that are in there and there's thousands of different species. Some people talk about the genetics and there's over 300 million genes. It's also important to understand that we've only identified some, not most of the organisms that are in our microbiomes. Our microbiomes are important for a lot of our normal functions. They help us with the metabolism of nutrients. They synthesize something called secondary bile acids that help us to digest fats. They help us to metabolize things like car carbohydrates and fiber. And as a result, um, the digestion of those provides energy for us, stimulates further fat metabolism, and even contributes to uh, an anti-inflammatory mechanism in the body. The gut microbiome is clearly involved in what's called host immunity. It maintains homeostasis, not just in our gut, but also in our immune system as a whole. And the gut microbiome is involved in uh, the metabolism of different drugs and environmental chemicals that we come in contact with. So there's one particular bacteria called Ergothella lenta, and believe me, if, if these uh, sound like they're hard to pronounce, they are. So please forgive me as I go through some of the names of these things, if it sounds like I might mispronounce them. But that particular bacteria uh, inactivates a drug called digoxin. And also um, there are certain specific bugs in our microbiome that allow us to metabolize chemicals like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that we come in contact with. So where do we get this microbiome and how does it change? Well, it's believed that we are sterile in utero. 
and that most of us seed our gut microbiome as we pass through the birth canal. And then over the course of our lives, our microbiome gets changed. It gets changed by our genetics. It gets changed by our diet. It gets changed by the medications that we're exposed to. It gets changed by the exercises that we do. It gets changed by hormones. It gets changed by illnesses that we get. And it changes as a result of aging. We're going to talk about a lot of different kinds of studies of the microbiome. And I just want to give you some background on, on what these studies are. So there's going to be some studies where we're comparing the microbiome in a group of people with the disease to a group of people without the disease, what are called healthy controls. And in those kinds of studies, you'll see two types of results. Some people are actually looking at the organisms themselves and they may report them in a lot of different ways at the genus or the species level or at the level of the genes. And some people are actually looking at what are called the metabolomics of the microbiome. So not the organisms themselves, but the chemicals that the organisms produce. You'll see types of studies where um, we get ideas about what might be important in the microbiome and we actually test those ideas in animals. And in these studies, we typically start with animals that are raised in a germ-free environment. So they have really either no or very simple microbiomes themselves. And then these animals actually have uh, microbiomes inserted into them, either through fecal transplants or through the injection of certain very specific bacteria. And what we can then do in those animals is we can see what do they look like? How do they behave? We also have human trials. And, and so these are intervention trials. And there's two types. One is where a group of people are given what's called a fecal transplant or a fecal microbiome transplant. We abbreviate those as FMTs. And the other is where a group of people get either prebiotics or probiotics. So let's just talk a little bit more about those two types of interventions. On the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see what I mean by fecal transplants. So here you take the stool from a healthy person who does not have the disease of interest and you screen the stool to make sure it doesn't have any bad infections in it. And then you process it. Basically you, you blend it up and you can create either a liquid or you can put that blended stool into capsules. And to insert this into the um, gut of the uh, sick person, you can do that either through a colonoscopy where it's literally squirted into the large intestine, or you can have the person either swallow the capsules or have them swallow what's called a nasogastric tube and put the stool down into the stomach that way. And when it comes to prebiotics and probiotics, Probiotics are actually live organisms, typically bacteria or yeast. And there's several different places you can get these in a normal diet, yogurt, kefir, buttermilk, aged cheese, sauerkraut, kimchi, sourdough bread, miso, tempa, kombucha, even beer and wine have those in them. Prebiotics are actually a form of fiber. And these serve as food for the organisms in our guts. And so some sources of prebiotics include chicory root, artichokes, dandelions, garlic, leeks, onions, whole wheat, fruits, vegetables, and legumes. So that's our background. Let's, let's turn our attention now to the role of the gut microbiome in gastrointestinal diseases. And let's start off with the simplest example, the one that we uh, understand the best, which is a disease called C. difficile colitis. This is a, a human bowel disease, which is characterized by severe abdominal pain and diarrhea. And the way people get this is there's an alteration in their microbiome, typically by the use of prolonged antibiotics. And it creates an opening for one particular type of bacteria called Clostridium difficile to overpopulate the gut. This bacteria produces a toxin which can directly damage cells in the intestines and can induce local inflammation. And it's that inflammation that really 
creates the clinical syndrome of the fever, the pain, and the diarrhea. So people have been doing fecal transplants for C. difficile colitis for over 50 years, but it's only been in the last five to 10 years that we've started to see randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials that prove that this treatment works. In fact, this particular trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine seven years ago was stopped early. It was stopped early because patients who were getting the fecal transplants for this condition were doing so much better than people getting the standard of care, which was a different antibiotic that the uh, Data Safety Monitoring Board did not feel that the study should continue. The cure rates for this condition with a fecal transplant are more than 90%. And when you're talking about fecal transplants, I already mentioned there's a lot of different ways to do them. There doesn't seem to be any clear difference between using fresh stool from healthy donors versus frozen stool, between putting uh, the fecal transplant in the upper versus the lower GI tract, or at least for this particular condition, between doing single versus multiple doses of fecal transplants. It's pretty well accepted now that, that this procedure, at least for this condition, is safe with proper screening. And those of you that have been following this literature probably know that in the last few months, the FDA actually came out with a black box warning for fecal transplants, saying that there have been cases of COVID-19 that have been transmitted through fecal transplants. So in addition to all the screening that we were doing prior to 2020, it's now important for fecal transplants to be screened for COVID-19 before they're administered. Let's now turn our attention to a little bit more complicated gastrointestinal disease or group of diseases. These are the inflammatory bowel diseases, also known as IBDs. These are a group of autoimmune diseases, which most obviously affect the bowels. They include Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. In addition to abdominal pain and diarrhea, people with these diseases can have pathology outside the gut. So they can have anemia, low red blood cell counts. They can develop blood clots. They can get skin problems. So sorry to put up this really gross picture. Hopefully you're not having lunch right now during this talk, but this is an example of some of the skin problems that people with these IBDs can get. This is something called pyoderma gangrenosum. They can also have joint problems and lung problems. And these people are most commonly, people with these IBDs are most commonly treated with medications that knock their immune system down. So like, for example, steroids. Interestingly, people with, with these IBDs have a different microbiome compared to healthy people. Their microbiome has what's called decreased diversity. It's much simpler. It's got a much smaller number of different organisms in it. When you look at the organisms themselves, people with IBD have more pro-inflammatory bacteria. For example, one called adherent invasive Escherichia coli. They also have decreases in anti-inflammatory bacteria. For example, one that's called fecal bacterium prosnosidae. In addition to different organisms, some of the biochemistry in the microbiome is different, probably as a result of the different organisms. So people with IBD have a decreased amount of things that are generally considered to be healthy, like butyrate. And they have an increased amount of things that are generally considered to be unhealthy, like for example, free radicals. So in animal models of IBD, where the IBD is created when the animals are forced to eat and drink things that cause inflammation in their guts, you can dramatically change what the disease looks like, not just in the gut, but also in the circulating immune system just by changing the microbiome. So for example, depending upon which bacteria you put in to the organisms, you can actually change the ratio of T cells that are floating around in these animals. You can actually create a much higher ratio of T helper 
to Treg cells, which is generally considered to be a pro-inflammatory situation. You can also change the levels of circulating chemicals like cytokines into a more pro-inflammatory situation. Some, but not all trials of fecal transplants and of probiotics in people with IBD show that you can improve the course of these diseases. Now, this is a general theme in uh, trials that have to do with the microbiome outside of the trials in Clostridia difficile in C. diff colitis. The trials that we're going to be looking at today are generally small and have lots of flaws and they often disagree with each other. And that is certainly the case with these IBD trials. Some, but not all trials show benefits from changing the microbiome. Okay, so that's all in good. Now you understand the microbiome and you understand its role in diseases of the gut. But what we're here to examine is the possible role of the microbiome in ALS. So it turns out that there's at least three different mechanisms by which the microbiome could influence ALS. And these are illustrated in this figure right here, which actually comes from a paper about the role of the microbiome in people with Parkinson's disease. And so the three mechanisms that the microbiome could use to influence ALS are toxins, increasing neuroinflammation, and removing something neuroprotective. So let's examine each one of those in turn. Let's start with the idea that there could be a toxin. Now, as I showed you in the case of C. diff colitis, it's not controversial at all that there could be a bacteria in the microbiome that produces a toxin that's bad for people. 15 years ago, the first paper came out postulating that ALS might be influenced by a gut microbiome toxin. This was a paper in the journal Medical Hypothesis by a man named Longstreth. Now his idea what there, that was that there might be a clostridial species in the, in the gut that could overpopulate and produce a toxin that would be taken up by the nervous system that innervates the gut and brought into the central nervous system where it would poison and kill motor neurons. It's not that far-fetched. Again, I already showed you that the microbiome can, can have an overpopulation of bacteria that produce toxins. And believe it or not, there is a clostridium, clostridium tetani, that is known to produce a toxin that can poison motor neurons. That's actually where the human disease tetanus can come from. But so far, there hasn't really been any evidence for this exact theory as a cause of ALS. But there is another toxin that is now pretty well accepted to be a cause of at least some cases of sporadic ALS. And the name of that toxin is beta-methylaminoalanine or BMAA. And really this story starts on the island of Guam many years ago, where it was recognized that ALS was 50 times more common in the native people of that, of that island, the people that were called Chamorros, than it was anywhere else in the world. And when these people died and they were autopsied, their brains were full of this chemical, BMAA. And that chemical was quickly determined to be something that could indeed kill motor neurons. And so the search was on to figure out where are these people coming in contact with this toxin? And, and two sources were found pretty quickly. There were seeds on the island. So that's what you see here called cycad seeds. And there were also these animals called flying squirrels. And, and both of these things had this toxin in them and the people of Guam would consume both of these things. And so with education and with the gradual extinction of these flying squirrels, the risk of ALS really dropped down on the island. But interestingly, it never went back down to zero it's still about five times higher on Guam than it should be. And the other thing that is interesting is that over the past couple of decades, people have started to notice that this toxin is present in the brains of some people from North America who died from ALS. And that also suggests that there must be other sources of this toxin because in North America, we don't have these seeds and we don't have a lot of flying squirrel consumption. And lo and behold, in 2009, 
another source of this toxin was discovered. It comes from something called cyanobacter. That is also known as blue-green algae. And so if you're around bodies of water where there's blue-green algae, you can actually either absorb this if you swim in that water, and it looks like you might even be able to inhale this if you live anywhere near those bodies of water. And people have done some epidemiology studies, and at least some of these studies are showing marked increases in the risk of ALS around bodies of water containing blue-green algae. For example, Lake Muscoma, New Hampshire, within five miles of that lake, the risk of ALS is 25 times higher than it is anywhere else in New England. And we're even starting to understand how this toxin might cause disease. It looks like it gets incorporated into proteins in place of the amino acid serine. And we can make animal models of this. If we feed animals a diet that has this toxin in it, they get sick. And if we give them lots of the normal amino acid serine at the same time, we can block the toxicity. And so what does this have to do with the microbiome? Well, it turns out there is a bacteria that has been isolated from the human uh, microbiome, which is called Melanobacter. And in the lab, at least, Melanobacter can produce BMAA. So think about that for a second. It means that not only might you be exposed to this toxin if you're around blue-green algae, but you actually might be exposed to this toxin if your microbiome changes. And somebody actually has a grant now, an NIH grant, to look for BMAA in the microbiome of people with neurodegenerative diseases like ALS. But I thought that was fascinating that we might actually be poisoning ourselves. The second of these three mechanisms is, is increasing neuroinflammation. I've already shown you that the microbiome can cause inflammation, not just in the gut, but actually can trigger an autoimmune disease. I showed you in, in those animal models of IBD that changes in the microbiome can change the circulating T cell populations and can circulate um, and can change the circulating cytokine levels, all of which contribute to a more pro-inflammatory state. There's no doubt that neuroinflammation is occurring in people with ALS. We know that people with ALS have different cytokine and complement profiles compared to healthy controls. We know that people with ALS have a lower T helper to T reg ratio compared to people, with, people with, without ALS. And we know that at least some people with ALS have activated microglia in their brains. And so this I think is one of the most fascinating figures that I've seen in the past five years in the ALS literature. This is from some work by my colleague, Naza Matasi. These are PET scans. And these are um, patients with ALS in the top three pictures, 10 of them that have been averaged, and healthy controls in the bottom three pictures. And all these patients were injected with a special chemical that is only picked up by activated microglia. And as you can see in those top three pictures, the brains of people with ALS are lighting up there's a lot more activated microglia in those patients than there are in healthy controls. So there's no doubt that neuroinflammation is occurring. The question is, what is triggering this neuroinflammation? And I would argue that it could be the microbi microbiome. Again, we've already looked at how certain bacteria can change cytokine profiles, can change T cell uh, ratios. There's even a paper last year that suggests that certain gut bacteria can modulate the function of microglia, including microglia that get into the central nervous system. And then there's this last mechanism. Maybe the microbiome changes in a way that removes something that normally is protective to our motor neurons. And this is not a new idea. This idea that, that ALS you know, could be caused or at least exacerbated by the loss of what's called a trophic factor, a protective factor. That's actually uh, in the first paper about ALS that was written by Charcot in the late 1800s. And that's where the name abiotrophic comes from. He thought that these people might have their disease because of the loss of some trophic factor that normally made muscle healthier.
amyotrophic, the loss of a trophic factor that worked on muscle. And there's lots of studies now that, that show that people with ALS have alterations in various trophic factors compared to the people without ALS. They're, these are nicely summarized in this book chapter here, but some of the things that are in the chapter, um, neurite growth factor, brain derived growth factor, glial derived growth factor, and even um, some chemicals that are, that are downstream that may not be directly growth factors themselves, but that might activate growth factors can all be different in people with ALS compared to healthy controls. There have been several trials that have tried to manipulate growth factors already in the history of ALS. Unfortunately, so far, none of those trials has really produced any dramatic benefits, but there are trials still going on. For example, many of you have heard about the neuron trial that's going on. And really the whole idea behind how those stem cells might work is by, by, by circulating growth factors. So, you know, Brainstorm that owns Neuron has a way of modifying a person's uh, bone marrow derived stem cells to make them secrete more growth factors. And those cells are then being injected back into that person's spinal fluid so that they float around for a while and secrete more growth factors. So it turns out that there are bacteria in all of our microbiomes that secrete things that might actually be healthy for our brains and our motor neurons. And one of those things is called butyrate. And another one of those things is called nicotinamide. Both of those are known to be secreted by um, bacteria that are in human microbiomes. So is there any evidence that people with ALS have a different microbiome compared to people without ALS? Well, there have been several studies trying to answer this question. Some of these studies say yes. So I've listed four studies here, one from 2016. It compared six people with ALS who were healthy enough to communicate, who had a breathing capacity of greater than 70% and who were not on antibiotics to five quote unquote healthy controls. And this study found that people with ALS had more of something called Doria and less of three bacteria called Anerostipase, Lachnospira and Oscillobacter. And interesting, those three bacteria can all produce butyrate, that chemical that I said might, might be a trophic factor. There's a study from 2017, looked at five patients with ALS who also had complaints of GI dysfunction, compared them to 96 quote unquote healthy controls. And that study found that people with ALS have a lower ratio of uh, firmicutes to bacteroides. And those bacteria are inv involved probably in, in regulating inflammation. And if that ratio is lower, that would predict a more in pro-inflammatory status. A study from 2018 compared 50 people with ALS who didn't have any GI complaints, didn't have any co comorbid autoimmune or inflammatory disease to 50 healthy controls that were matched for age, sex, and origin. And that study found that people with ALS had a higher abundance of pro-inflammatory bacteria like E. coli and Enterobacter and a lower abundance of anti-inflammatory organisms for example, some clostridial species and some yeasts. And finally, the most recent of these studies was in 2019. It took 37 patients with ALS. We don't know anything more about them than that and compared them to 29 healthy controls matched according to age and body mass index. And they were also said to come from the same family, although it's not clear that they were living in the same household. And that study found that people with ALS had a reduced level of one particular bacteria called Bifidobacterium pseudocantilutatum. And the importance of that difficult to pronounce bacteria is that it's involved in the synthesis of another trophic factor, which is called nicotinamide. But it may not be quite this simple because there are three other studies that didn't find any difference between people with ALS and healthy controls. And again, you know, the numbers are small. One study was, was 36 people with ALS versus 32 controls that were healthy and matched for age and gender. One was 47 people with ALS with no details compared to 49 that didn't have neurological or psychiatric disease. And the most recent one from 2020 
49 people with ALS with an FEC of at least 60% and 51 healthy spouses, family members, and friends. None of them found any difference. And so I told you in the beginning that a lot of times when you look at these microbiome studies, they're just not very consistent. The results are not very consistent. And that's certainly true of, of these studies, you know, looking for differences in people with ALS versus healthy controls. So why? Why all this variability? Well, first of all, there's a lot of differences in methodology between these studies that I just showed you. Um, as you probably heard, the types of patients with ALS that are being admitted to these studies are probably very different. In some cases, they're only taking people who are very early in the course of the disease, and in some cases, they're not paying attention to that. Some of these cases may have had some patients with familial ALS, maybe some didn't. There's also differences in the types of controls that are being used. You know, some of them are much more careful than others about how they match controls. And that's probably really important. You know, if you're looking for a, whether or not the microbiome can cause disease, you probably got to minimize all the other things that might cause changes in the microbiome. And I told you about all of those in the beginning. And so you might want to really carefully match your controls at least have people who are living in the same household who are presumably getting exposed to the same foods and the same toxins every day. The source of the samples in these studies is also different. Some of these studies use stool, some of them use saliva. The storage and processing of the samples that were used in these studies is very different. Some of them analyzed the samples right away. Some of them froze the samples and they froze them in different ways and for different lengths of time. And finally, the types of analyses that were run are very different. Some of these people uh, did what's called whole exome sequencing, meaning that you, you looked at basically every gene you could think of in the microbiome. Some of them only did um, exome slices where they were looking for certain bacteria. Some of them didn't even look at the bacteria. They only looked at some of the chemicals that bacteria produce. So those are all possible explanations. But there's one more possible explanation and this is the one that I think might be true. Maybe these studies were asking the wrong question. You know, um, in the animal studies of IBD, you can't actually produce IBD by changing the microbiome. What you can do is you can make the disease better or worse by changing the microbiome. And so it may not be that the microbiome can cause ALS, it may be that changes in the microbiome can change the progression of the disease. And there's only one study that really looked carefully at this. And this is the most recent study that came out uh, just last month. Um, and, and what this is, is uh, what's called a, a Kaplan-Meier curve. And it looks at the probability of survival in three different groups based upon their microbiome. Let me just take a sip of water here for a second. So these three groups were distinguished by something called the Shannon index. And that is a way to look at the complexity of the microbiome. So the higher the Shannon index, the greater the number of different organisms in a person's microbiome. And so uh, the folks with the simplest microbiome, the lowest Shannon index are the ones in the aqua blue curve the people with the most complex microbiome, the most different bacteria and most different organisms in their microbiome are delineated by the red curve. And then the people who sort of have an intermediate Shannon index, an intermediate level of complexity are the gray curve. But I want you to compare the 50% survival risk in this red curve versus this blue curve. And to give you some sort of perspective, we get really excited when these curves separate by a few months. That's actually what led to the approval of the drug Riliazole. The people on Riliazole compared to the people on placebo, the 50% prob probability of survival was about three months different in those two groups. And that led to FDA approval. But if you look at that difference here, it's more like 50 months, 50, five zero, orders of magnitude, beyond what we see with Riliazole. So it looks to me like, at least in this study, the microbiome might drastically 
change the progression of ALS. We also, of course, have some studies that were done in ALS animal models. One of the earliest studies showed that changes in the animal's microbiome and uh, abnormalities in the intestinal tight junction and permeability started in these animals long before any weakness started. And I should say, remember that these animals are made by inserting abnormal genes into the animals. So these are most obviously genetic models of ALS. So this is a really fascinating study that was published in Nature. They, um, they looked at the uh, influence of the microbiome on these genetic animal models. If they raised these animals in germ-free conditions, or they gave these animals broad spectrum antibiotics, or they inserted certain specific pro-inflammatory bacteria like Ruminococcus torquus or Pura bacteroides dystanosis, they could dramatically speed up disease progression in these genetic models. If they fed these genetic mice butyrate, which again is the natural product of a healthy microbiome, or they put in other anti-inflammatory bacteria like one called Acromantia mucinophilia, they could dramatically slow down the progression of the disease in these animals. And then finally, there was uh, actually a poster that I saw at a meeting a few years ago. I haven't seen any paper come out about this yet, but this was actually a worm model of ALS. And the poster was kind of amazing because what it showed is just by changing the microbiome in this worm, they could dramatically change how much movement the animal had. So have there been any trials like this in patients with ALS? Well, the only one that I'm aware of is this one. And um, this is a probiotic called Rafa LX. It's a probiotic that's high in something called Lactobacillus planarum. And this is a glutamate synthetase producing bacteria. And the idea here is that maybe this bacteria could help someone deal with the excessive amounts of glutamate that we think might play a role in ALS. And so to my knowledge, this hasn't actually been published in a medical journal. This was taken off the website of the company. I know this is kind of hard to read, so I'll try to read it for you. What they did here is a, a very small trial. It was just 16 people with ALS and they all got this Rafa LX for 24 weeks and their progression on the ALS functional rating score was compared to how they were doing before they were treated with the probiotic. And what they did is something called the responder analysis. They looked at the percentage of these folks who had a 25% slowing, a 33% slowing, a 50% slowing, and a 70% slowing compared to how they were doing before treatment. And they compared those different levels of improvement to patients who were in the PROACT database who were receiving placebo. And so in this trial, about 50% of patients who were treated with the probiotic had a 25% improvement. That's about double what was seen in PROACT in people on placebo. About 43% of the trial population had a 33% slowing. And again, um, that's about double what was seen in PROACT. 43% had a 50% slowing, which is about three times what was seen in PROACT. And almost 40% had a 70% slowing, which is four times what was seen in PROACT. And all of these turn out to be statistically significant differences. And so the, the company website says that they are planning a larger phase two trial of this. I think it's very exciting. So that's it as far as, as, far as studies in people with ALS so far. But there's a lot that's happening or about to happen. So I was glad to see this one on clinicaltrials.gov. This is a trial of fecal transplants for people with ALS. It's gonna be randomized, double blind and placebo controlled. 28 people with ALS are gonna get fecal transplants and 14 are gonna get placebo. And uh, they're gonna have 12 months of follow-up. And the fecal transplants are gonna come from healthy donors. And they're gonna be administered at baseline and at month six. And they have some really interesting outcome measures. They have the clinical measures, the ALS functional rating scale, the breathing measure, force vital capacity and survival. But they also have a lot of interesting biomarkers. They're gonna look at serum neurofilaments, serum cytokines, serum T cell populations, 
Um, and they're also going to do biopsies of, of the intestine and look at the intestinal microbiome. So according to clinicaltrials.gov, this is now open. It's enrolling in Italy, and it's expected to have results in 2022. I couldn't help but mention this one. I've been talking to you about this for at least two years. This is my trial of theracurmin, a form of curcumin. This is actually one of my ROAR trials. So just to remind you, ROAR stands for replication of ALS reversals. This is a whole uh, program I have of pilot trials that are based upon cases of what I call ALS reversals. People whose medical records suggest they really did have ALS and that they progressed to disability and then they made dramatic and unexpected recovery of lost motor function, sometimes all the way back to normal. And I now know of 48 of these ALS reversals. Now, there's a lot of different explanations for why these reversals might have happened. But of course, one explanation is maybe it was something that these people were taking. Six of the 48 ALS reversals were taking some form of curcumin. There's no other supplement associated with more ALS reversals. Of all the different forms of curcumin that are out there, I think this form is the most exciting, theracurmin. It's a water soluble form of curcumin. And it has a lot of different mechanisms of action that could theoretically help people with ALS. It's an antioxidant, it's anti-inflammatory, it can impair protein aggregation. But relevant to this talk, theracurmin, this exact product, can change the microbiome in mice. It can increase levels of butyrate producing bacteria. And in these animals, it can actually increase the, the percentage of circulating T regs, which I think is very interesting. So this is a 50 patient, widely inclusive, open label, prospective, six month long virtual trial. And it's gonna be looking at safety, efficacy, and the saliva and stool microbiome at three different time points. And I'm also going to be enrolling healthy controls defined as people without any neurodegenerative disease who live in the same household as the participant. And they're going to give me three microbiomes over the six months as well. So I'll be able to look at a lot of interesting things in this study. I'll be able to determine if theracurmin can reverse ALS. I'll be able to determine if theracurmin can alter the microbiome. And this will be the largest study and I think best controlled study looking at what exactly does the microbiome do in ALS? Is it different compared to healthy controls? Is it different in fast versus slow progressors? That trial is now open, by the way, at Duke. And um, expecting that trial to fill up pretty quickly, we already have well over the 50 names that we need for the trial. But if folks are interested in being put on the waiting list for that, you can certainly email me and I'll let my coordinator know. Um, and then there's also this study, which is going to soon be happening at Duke. This is the study of the microbiome in the ALS reversals. It's part of my STAR program. STAR is the study of ALS reversals. So in addition to uh, what I told you before, some of the other theories about why some people with ALS might get better is maybe they were different in the first place. Maybe it didn't matter what they did to themselves. Maybe they were gonna beat ALS no matter what. And I'm trying to find out what might be different. Could it be their genetics? Could it be their immune system? Could it be their microbiome? And so I'm gonna be comparing the saliva and stool microbiome of as many of these ALS reversals as I can get to that of people with more typically progressive ALS. And you might say, well, it's kind of far-fetched that there could be something in the microbiome of, of these people that made them resistant to ALS. Not really, there's actually a precedent for that. So for example, there are certain uh, gut microbiomes that make people in India resistant to a terrible infection, a life-threatening infection called cholera. And you can actually transfer that resistance from one of these people to another person and make them resistant to cholera by a fecal transplant. And so it would be fascinating if I could find that these ALS reversals had something very different about their microbiome. And if I could develop a fecal transplant using their stool and actually give that to people with more typically progressive ALS and reverse their disease. And I'll be collaborating with what I think is one of the best microbiome centers in the world. Duke has one of the largest and most comprehensive centers for studying the microbiome. So I'm so happy to 
be on the same campus as people who have a lot of expertise in this. And I'm hoping to get that off the ground in the next few months. So to kind of wrap this up, I've shown you today that we all have, you know, tons of organisms living on and in our body, microbiomes. They're in different parts of our bodies and they actually influence our health. I've shown you that the gut microbiome definitely plays a role in certain gastrointestinal diseases. And I've shown you some evidence that maybe the gut microbiome could play a role in ALS. It's still pretty controversial. And I would say right now, I think it's more likely that it plays a role in determining the speed of ALS progression than it does in determining who gets ALS and who doesn't. But the good news is we've got lots of studies underway now at multiple institutions, including Duke, to better delineate the role of the microbiome in ALS and in ALS reversals. And really we need these studies to tell us whether fecal transplants or any specific pre or probiotics or supplements like Theracurmin might be useful in people with ALS. And so I'll just finish now by, by thanking you. Thanks to the organizers. I think this is the maybe the fourth year that you've invited me to your symposium. And I'm always so thrilled to be there. You have such an amazing organization there in Florida, incredible patients and families and incredible um, institutions and lots of great doctors and scientists. I wanna make sure I thank uh, patients with ALS who are out there. You know, you're the ones who inspire me to get up and work so hard and continue to push the envelope in terms of what we're thinking about as, as ways to try to make this disease better. Um, you also are the ones that participate in all these studies. And in fact, you're the ones that fund a lot of these studies. I wanna especially thank the Larry Vance Hughes ALS Foundation. They're the ones uh, who fund a lot of my work and also the Freelon Foundation, another uh, family that is funding the Thera Kerman trial. I've got lots of amazing collaborators around my institution, including some medical students, including the folks at Patients Like Me that are a huge partner in the Thera Kerman trial and the Duke Microbiome Center that's gonna help me make sense